As we've looked at a lot of different financial statement transactions, we've looked at uh, detailed examples of how to record the transactions. For example, think about what we did with inventory. We had lots of uh, transactions involving the purchase and the sale of inventory, the return of merchandise, taking discounts, offering discounts to customers. And we looked at it on a perpetual basis and a periodic basis um, and lots of details. Now, you might think we would do the same thing with cash transactions, but the reality is by default, a lot of transactions end up touching the cash account. So we end up talking about the details of recording cash transactions when we talk about other areas of the financial statements. There are, however, a few nuances that I'd like to discuss when it comes solely to cash. One of them is this concept of cash over and short. Take a look at this excerpt from a point of sale system. So retail businesses, they often have a cash register or in more modern terms, they have a point of sale system where um, if it's, especially if it's cloud-based, you could have an app on your phone, for example, and kind of see a real-time dashboard. So pretend that our cashiers ring up sales of $10,130.50. Okay? But at the end of the day, when we count down the cash register, we only have $10,000 in there. So the question is this, if we count the cash drawer and there's $10,000, that's what's going to get deposited into the bank. But sales revenue was really $10,130.51. How do we record that? Well, let's look at it. Let's look at the journal entry. So debits, credits, okay. Remember, cash is an asset account. Assets get increased with a debit entry. So the journal entry to increase cash would be a $10,000 debit. Um, as a reminder, when you're trying to construct journal entries, if you get to a kind of a sticking point, if you get a writer's block, if you will, preparing a journal entry, start with the easiest parts, the parts that you know uh, for certain. And I can tell you that if I were the business owner and I had $10,000 in the cash drawer, one of the first things I would do is go to the bank and deposit it so that that money was secure. So I know that I'm going to increase my cash account. That's going to require a debit. Well. Uh, we're going to need to have some credits over here, and one of those is going to be sales revenue on the income statement. Sales revenue is an income account, and our sales revenue is $10,130.51. After all, that's what our cashiers run into the cash register, into the point of sale system. So we've got a little problem here. Debits are $10,000. Credits are a little over $10,130. This journal entry does not balance. A bookkeeping system will not allow you to even save this journal entry. So what you're seeing is we need something debited in the amount of $130.51 just to make this journal entry balance. Well, what would that be? Now, different companies might uh, have different terminology or different labels for this, but what we're going to do is we're going to record an expense. And in this case, it's cash over or short. You might just call it cash shortage or something like that. But look at what's really happening here. We're recording revenues on the income statement, $10,130. On the balance sheet, we're seeing the cash increase, but we did not collect, uh, well, or somehow $130 is missing. Either we made a mistake, maybe somebody stole the money, but the bottom line at the end of the day is this $130 is not here. So that becomes an expense of the business, something that reduces our net income. Now, sure, we could just take a shortcut and we could have done this. We could have said, well, let's just record sales revenue at $10,000, but that doesn't accurately, accurately reflect what really happened. What really happened was we generated this revenue, but we did not collect all of it in the form of payment as cash. So we need to present what really happened and that expense, we need to track that separately. Uh, not only could that be useful to people reading the financial statements, but if I were management, I would want to keep a close eye on that number because if we see this as a continuing trend, we probably have a systemic problem that we need to investigate. Another nuance involving cash that we need to discuss is a concept called petty cash. And honestly, it is so petty that it's almost not worth discussing. But there are a couple bookkeeping nuances that I would like to explore. 
Uh, but, but the reality is petty cash is going to be immaterial for any organization that I can conceive. It's petty. It's not a lot of dollars. Uh, what it is, and I had to pre-draw this because um, I'll tell you what, I'm an accountant. I'm a lot of things. An accountant, an airplane pilot, almost became an engineer at one point, but I'm not an artist. And this, took, this was a painstaking effort. So we've got our petty cash box. Now imagine, you, you guys have seen this. It's a kind of gray steel metal box. And inside this, there's probably a tray for some dollar bills and coins and whatnot. And we want to fund this petty cash box because sometimes there is a need for payment and we, we don't have time to go through the normal accounts payable process of approval and disbursement of funds. Um, sometimes we just want to buy donuts for the office or we need a roll of stamps or we need to buy a pizza for the office lunch, that kind of thing. Uh, maybe somebody needs to get reimbursed for taxi cab fare. So we need a little bit of cash on hand, currency, dollar bills, and coins. So what we're going to do is we're going to put $200 into this box. Okay? Picture 10 $20 bills. And to do that, what we end up doing, I'm going to show you the journal entry here. We're going to debit an account called Petty Cash. And we actually credit cash. Okay. In a lot of companies, I've seen it happen this way, where there's a petty cash custodian, um, let's call him Justin, and Justin's in charge of the petty cash box, so what the company does is the company actually writes a check to Justin, him personally. He goes to the bank, cashes that check, and brings the $200 back to the company, puts it in the locked box. So the company's checking account right here is getting reduced with a credit entry, and a new asset called petty cash Go, comes on the balance sheet. Now, petty cash is what's called an impressed account balance. Okay. On our balance sheet, on our trial balance, this account will always have a $200 debit balance, even if the box is empty. And you'll see this in a second because of the way that we record the transactions. And yes, that's inaccurate, right? If the box has nothing in it but a bunch of receipts, no coins, no currency, but our balance sheet still reports $200. It's not accurate, but it's also not material. So it really doesn't matter. It would not influence the informed decisions uh, of, an, of a decision maker. So we're okay with it because uh, sometimes convenience is a factor here. Let's assume that we had to have lunch catered for an office meeting. So what do we do? Uh, one of our employees goes out, picks up the food, Pay, well, even before they pick up the food, they're gonna go see Justin, our petty cash custodian, and they're gonna say, Justin, I need $100. Okay, so Justin gives that person five $20 bills, uh, go to the restaurant, get the food, pay with $100, come back with some change and a receipt. And what's gonna happen then? When all is said and done, this petty cash box no longer has $200 in it. It has $114.21. It also has a receipt okay, for $85.79. Okay, I'm just going to draw our little receipt right there. So what you see is after we reimburse the employee, the petty cash box has less money in it, but the total of the money and the receipts for things that we purchased still equals $200. We're a hungry office. Here's another food receipt. We send somebody out, they get the food, they come back with the change in the receipt, uh, we've effectively reimbursed them $29.89. Now the box only has $84.32 in it, but we do have this second receipt. Oh, what was the dollar amount there? $29.89. So we're depleting the funds, but the total of the dollars and the receipts still adds up to the $200 impressed balance. Then we run out of postage stamps, so we send somebody to the post office, they come back with the roll of stamps, give us a receipt you can see over there for $55 for that roll of, roll of stamps. Now the box really doesn't have a whole bunch of cash in it. We're down to $29.32. And yes, the trial balance will still say petty cash, debit balance 200. I know that's inaccurate. I know we only have $29 in there, but it doesn't matter. 
it's immaterial, okay? That's the nature of petty cash. It's also the nature of petty cash that it's time to reimburse this fund because we couldn't even buy another roll of stamps. We might be able to buy a lunch or something like that with $29. So we're gonna have to replenish the funds. It's worth noting that not only is the petty cash balance inaccurate on the balance sheet at this point, but the income statement is incomplete. There are expenses that are missing from our income statement. For example, here's a, we would probably call this something like meals and entertainment expense or office meals or something like that. That's $115.68. That expense has not yet been recorded on the income statement. We also have uh, maybe an office expense or a postage expense. Uh, different companies might use different terminology, but our income statement up to this point does not record any of these expenses. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to replenish the funds, and at that point, that is when we'll recognize these expenses on the income statement. And it does potentially violate the matching principle. Uh, we'll see this because you'll see this receipt over here. What's the date? June 27. This receipt is July, and this receipt is also July. So if we make a reimbursement of this fund, let's say around July 4th, probably not on the 4th, we're closed, but you get the point. We're going to be recognizing one expense that really occurred in June, but we're okay with it. Yep, it's not exactly correct. It does violate the matching principle, but it's such an insignificant amount that it really just doesn't matter. This box is supposed to have $200 in it. Right now, it only has $29.32. So a little bit of math, nothing too complicated here, tells us that we, we need to replenish that box with $170.68. That will get it back to its $200 level. So we're gonna write a check to Justin, or maybe we write it out to just cash, but the, the takeaway is this. We're gonna write a check, and somebody's gonna go to the bank and cash that check, and they're gonna come back to the office with $170.68 of coins and currency so we can replenish this fund. Um, what are we gonna do? We're gonna recognize our expenses. Remember that meals and entertainment expense? 115 bucks, it's over there. The office expense is $55. This should balance out nicely. The total of our debits here is, what do we have, $170.68 if we add both of these amounts. Total of credits is $170.68. So the journal entry balances with debits and credits, we know that the $170.68 is what we need to replenish the fund. And we're gonna basically take these receipts out of the box, probably staple them to the checks, or maybe even, and I hope this is the case, make a PDF or some image of it, shred the documents, and retain these electronically so we have a record of what did we spend this $170 to purchase. But now we're ready to start over with fresh $200 in the box and we'll start buying some lunches and postage stamps and reimbursing for taxi fare and we'll eventually have to reimburse that fund once again. One final nuance I want to mention regarding cash. Take a look at this company's balance sheet. Not only do they have cash and cash equivalents listed as part of their current assets, but they've got another category of cash reported as restricted cash. Um, and, and what I'd like to point out is this, is that sometimes there are restrictions on our ability, on a company's ability to use cash to fund its operations. These are restrictions that could be imposed by the company's board of directors, could be imposed by the company's lender. Sometimes lenders require a company to maintain a compensating cash balance as a protection to the lender, just in case the company were to not make its payments. Sometimes there may be other legal restrictions on cash. The takeaway is this. This cash up here, as you're reading the financial statements, you can count on that cash being available to fund the company's operations, okay? It's available for the company to use to pay its bills. But this cash down here, while it is cash, it's not available for our current operations. Now, it may become available in the future. If we want to understand the nature of that restriction, the timing of the restriction, maybe when the restriction will be released, guess what we need to consult? We need to consult the notes to the financial statements. Remember that those financial statement notes 
are so critical in providing the context that can explain, can amplify, can place the financial statements in proper context. So if I were reading this company's balance sheet and I wondered about this restricted cash, the first thing I would do is look to the financial statement notes. If you're looking at it online or even in a Adobe PDF, I would just hit Control F, look for the word restricted. You'll quickly find the answer.